Father God, as we pause on this December morning, we pause to thank you for the Christ of Christmas. Thank you, Father, for the worshipful songs, and thank you for the reminder of what this season means to us, for you truly are the reason for the season. God bless each one that's here today, those that are listening from far away. I pray your blessings of peace to be with them and their families during not only this Christmas season, but throughout this new year coming. Father, bless us this morning. Speak to our hearts once again through the book of Ecclesiastes. For it's in Christ's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Many years ago, I was reading through a story one day and I ran across these words and I have never forgotten them. Days of youth speed all too quickly and troubled skies come all too soon. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived according to the Bible, would have a question for you and me this morning, and that question is this, is life worth living? Is life worth living? There would be many people this morning that would say yes, life is worth living, even with all of its hardships and trials and with all of its challenges and with all of its problems. But there would be other people that would say, no, I've given up on life and life is not worth living. Unfortunately, every 40 seconds worldwide, someone takes their life. Solomon, many years ago, young people experimented. He navigated uh, with all of his excursions of life under the sun. And that phrase, life under the sun, is repeated throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, and it means living life without God, living life without Christ in your heart and life. Uh, and he gave four arguments to support his conclusion, if you live life without God under the sun, he spoke about four arguments that he had for that, the monotony of life, the vanity of wisdom, the futility of wealth, and the certainty of death. Solomon delivered and reviewed and looked at his arguments, and now when you come to the ending of the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 11 and 12 for this morning, he comes back with a whole different equation. This time, he has included God into life, and what a difference it makes. Solomon realized that the monotony of life, uh, it filled with all of its challenging situations. When God is with you, and God is in you, then God has a reason and a purpose for bringing you through the challenging and the difficult times. Solomon also learned that wealth is fleeting, that it could be enjoyed or that it can be employed to the glory of God. Though man's wisdom couldn't explain everything, but his conclusion was better to follow God's wisdom than to practice the foolishness of mankind. As far as for the certainty of death, Solomon would tell us there's no way to escape it, and it should motivate us to enjoy life and to make the most of seizing all of the opportunities in life that we can. And in this final sermon for these past 10 weeks on Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us his conclusion. He also gives us his personal application. He presents us with four vignettes or four pictures of life. And attached to each picture is a practical admonition for his listeners and for those who read to heed what he teaches us. These four pictures parallel his four arguments that Solomon wrestled with throughout the book. Life is not monotonous, rather it's an adventure of faith. That is everything but predictable or tedious, yes, he would tell us death is certain, but life truly is a gift from God, and he wants you and me to live it and to live it abundantly. As well as wealth is concerned, as far as the wealth 
is concerned, Solomon would say, use your wealth, use your life as a stewardship from God. And then one day when you stand before him, you will give an accounting. And that's what Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. If you're taking notes this morning from the bulletin, let me give you four important things Solomon leaves us with uh, from our series of these past 10 weeks. First of all, life is a, an adventure. Life is an adventure. Live it by faith. Life is an adventure. Live it by faith. Notice he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days, giving a serve, serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. As Elf B. Meyer, the British expositor said, he said, I married adventure. And that meant living by faith and expecting the unexpected. Now, in those verses that we see, Solomon gave two scenes, one that to illustrate his point, he uses the merchant sending out his ships in verses 1 and 2. And then secondly, he uses the illustration of the farmer who is sowing his seed in verses 3 through 6. And in both of these illustrations is a great idea that you have to have faith uh, that's required in those because neither the merchant... Uh, nor the farmer can control the circumstances. Storms come, reefs come, tsunamis come, uh, the attack of pirating and the cargo that could be lost. Bad weather or insects could destroy the crop and the farmer's labor would be in vain. And Solomon is saying, if the merchant and the farmer waited until the circumstances were idea, they would never get anything done, and life has a certain amount of risk to it, and that's where our faith comes in. If any of you watched last evening on News Nation, they did a documentary for about 45 minutes about 20 million acres of farmland in America that has been poisoned by what they call PFRAS, P-L-R-A-S. And in that, it is the sludge that comes from waste materials after they've gone through the process of making those where they could be used. However, in the sludge that they put on the farmland, it has now created incredible problems and health risk for Americans. In fact, Erin Brockovich was on there last night, and she was speaking to the uh, EPA and to all of these uh, in government who had failed the American people in that endeavor. In fact, they said last evening, 97% of Americans in your blood would have this poisoning. They have no idea what it's going to do to people in the future. In fact, one of the uh, commentators last evening who was doing the documentary had gone for a blood test herself and the doctor was giving her the results of that lab report and he said, you will have to follow up 
in the days to come because you have an enormous amount of this PFAS in your blood system. And they begin to name off the various things that it's creating and causing in people's lives, not to know what else it will cause. They were talking about the farmers who were losing millions of dollars, losing their family farms that they'd had for uh, hundreds of years, and all of the dairy cattle that had to be put down because the milk was impure. And they spoke about these great hazards that are in our world today and the failing of the system to take care of those because it had been documented, it had been uh, wiped away, cleared under the rug, and now it's creating a major part for us. So when I read what Solomon had to say about the farmers and his crops, I could not help but think where we are when it comes to these situations in our world today. They were talking about the explosion of cancer and how that in this PFRAS, these are causing cancer in people as well as many other health issues and other health, health issues to arise in the future. Well, when I think about that, farming was not easy in Solomon's day, and it's certainly not easy today. In verse 3, he contrasted the clouds with the trees. In verse 4, the wind, the wind is never right for the sower, and the clouds are never right for the reaper. In other words, Solomon is saying, life is an adventure, and you've got to live it by faith. Even when your circumstances look adverse, Solomon speaks in verse 5 of the wind, and we all know what the wind can do. So Solomon says to you and me, his conclusion, his personal application, after he had gone through life and was trying to search for meaning and purpose and peace and contentment, Solomon came to the, to the conclusion that life is truly an adventure, and if you're going to live it, you have to live it by faith. Secondly, he gives us this morning there in your bulletin, life is a gift. Life is a gift, so enjoy it. Life is a gift, enjoy it. And Solomon gives us three instructions in chapter 11, verse 7, through chapter 12, verse 8. And let me give you these. He says, first of all, rejoice. Rejoice. He gives these three instructions. Do you rejoice each morning when you awaken? You know, see, Solomon especially said, young people, to you, to take advantage of the days of youth, before all of the days of gloom and doom and darkness come into play. He was not suggesting that young people have no problems and that older people have no joys. He was just making a generalization that youth is the time to enjoy uh, particular things in life before the problems of old age began to creep in. One man made this observation when he was in his 90s. He was still very much alert and with it, and he said this, I don't go out much now because my parents won't let me. Young people, he said, my parents are mother nature and father time. So he said, rejoice, rejoice, awaken to each new day and rejoice, rejoice. And then he gave a second instruction in chapter 11, verse 10. He said, remove. In other words, remove the things from your life that, that would uh, uh, get you in trouble, that would create issues, fleshly desires. And then he gave a third instruction in chapter 12, verse 1 through 8, he said, remember, it's easy to neglect the Lord when you're caught up in the enjoyments and the opportunities of youth, the dark days and the difficult days. So we better lay a good spiritual firm foundation if we are going to adventure in life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 3 through 7, he gives one of the most imaginative descriptions of old age and death that are found anywhere in literature. Now, there are various students of Scripture that interpret some of these things differently, but most of them see these verses as a picture 
of a house falling apart and finally turning to dust. When it speaks about the keepers of the house, it's speaking of your arms and your hands and how eventually many people will begin to tremble. Where it speaks about the strong men, uh, your legs, your knees, and your shoulders weaken and you begin to become stooped and bent over. He speaks about the grinders. You start to lose your teeth. He speaks about the windows, your vision, visual issues. How many of you out there this morning have visual issues you don't see as well at night with the bright lights of the cars coming down the road and vision begins to deteriorate? He speaks about the doors, either your hearing begins to fail or you close your mouth because you've lost your teeth. Where it speaks of grinding, you cannot chew your food or your ears can't pick up the sounds outdoors. When he speaks about rising up, you wake up with the birds early each morning and you wish you could sleep longer. How many of you take melatonin? How many of you take Tylenol PM to go to sleep at night? Uh, then he speaks about music. When you sing, your voice begins to quiver, afraid. You're terrified of heights. You're afraid of falling as you walk down the street. When he speaks of the almond tree, uh, if you have any hair left, he says it turns white like almond blossoms. When he speaks of the grasshopper, he's speaking about you just drag yourself along as a grasshopper would. When he speaks of desire, uh, you lose your appetite. How many people lose their appetite and, and no longer uh, can eat and, and people want to force them to eat and, and if they can't, they can't. Maybe the desire, you lose your sexual desire uh, where he speaks about long home, you go to your eternal home and people mourn your death. Verse number six, he describes a golden bowl, a lamp that hangs from the ceiling with a silver chain and the chain breaks and the bowl breaks. The fragile cord of life is snapped and the light of life goes out. Back in Solomon's day, only the wealthy people could have such costly lamps. So Solomon may be hinting there that death is no respecter of persons, the poor or the rich. The verse also pictures a well for bringing up a picture, pitcher filled with water. One day the wheel breaks and the pitcher is shattered and the end comes. The fountain of water was an ancient image for life and when the machinery of life stops working, the water of life stops flowing and the heart stops pumping and the blood stops circulating and death has come, and the spirit leaves the body, and the body begins to decay and eventually returns to the dust. Solomon would say to you and me this morning, in a personal application in his conclusion, not only is life an adventure, young people, live it, but live it by faith. Secondly, life is a gift. Take life every day, enjoy every day. Be thankful, be grateful that you can walk, open your eyes of the morning and get out of bed. Last evening I watched a documentary on Christopher Reeve's life and how after his accident he was a quadriplegic. And I thought to myself, how many of us wake up of a morning, we get out of bed and we amble around and, and uh, then we, we walk, we talk, we breathe, we move, we have our being and how oftentimes we take so much of that for granted. But let me tell you, he would say life is a gift. Enjoy it. Seize the opportunity, the Latin term carpe diem, to seize the day, to seize every opportunity that you have. Thirdly, he would give us another personal application and conclusion this morning. Not only is life an adventure, live it by faith. Secondly, life is a gift, so you better enjoy it. While you can, he gave three instructions, rejoice, remove, and remember. And thirdly, this morning, life is a school, learn your lessons. Life is a school, learn your lessons. Notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 12, and moreover, 
Solomon said, because the preacher was wise, that was Solomon, he still taught the people knowledge, yes. He pondered and sought out and said in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the works of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, he says, be admonished by these of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Someone made this observation about life being like a school, except that sometimes you don't know what the lessons are until you failed the examination. How true is that? Sometimes we don't know what the lessons are until we failed the examination. God primarily teaches us from his word, but he also teaches us through creation and history and the various experiences of life. Solomon explained the characteristics of his own work as a teacher of God's truth. In verse 9, the word wise, he studied, he explored many subjects and some of his conclusions he wrote down for me and you in the book of Proverbs. In verse 9, the word order, after studying a matter, Solomon weighed his conclusions carefully and then arranged them in an orderly fashion. Solomon used words of truth, the word inspired. In verse 11, Solomon claimed that the words that he was giving were inspired, given by God, uh, the one shepherd. Uh, the word goads means he, to prod the people to pay attention and to pursue truth. The word nails, give them something on which to hang what they have learned. You see, good teaching requires both. The student must be motivated to study, and the instructors must be able to nail things down so that the lesson makes sense and is done with ease. He reminds us in verse 12, don't permit man's books young people, to rob you of God's wisdom. Uh, books are written by men, but God's truth is written by the Holy Spirit of God. So test what you read in secular material to the Word of God. Life truly is a school, and we must learn the lessons. And sometimes those are good lessons, and sometimes they are tough lessons. A fourth thing Solomon would give us today, not only is life an adventure, so live it by faith, but secondly, life is a gift. Enjoy it. Thirdly, life is a school. Learn its lessons. And lastly, this morning, life is a stewardship. Life is a stewardship. Fear God. Young people, what does that mean? Life is a stewardship. God has given you a life. God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. You are to be a good steward. The Bible says it's required that a steward be found faithful. Someday you and I will stand individually at a place called the judgment seat of Christ. Now that will only be for those who are saved. Those who have ever trusted Christ will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we will not be judged that day for our salvation because he secured that on Calvary's cross through the shedding of his blood. And if you have truly, genuinely been born again and received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, your sins are under the blood of Christ. And according to the book of Psalms, he remembers them as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. But at the judgment seat of Christ, it will not be for whether you're saved or not. If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you will be saved. You are saved there, but you will give an accounting. What did I do with my life for Jesus from the day I got saved until I someday stand in his presence. The things that I've done, did I do them for show? Did I do them to be, to get the accolades of praise of men? Did I do them for all the right reasons, for all the right attitudes? If I did them for all the right reasons, I will be rewarded for that. But if I did not do those for the right reasons, those things will be burned up. 
yet I will be saved as by fire. But young people, there's going to be another judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. That is the one at the end of the ages. And anyone who appears at that great white throne judgment will be lost forever and ever and ever and ever. And they will stand there in the presence of the judge. And the Bible says he has books. And their works could not save them. And he has a book with the saved in it. And he'll say, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. Solomon would say to you and me this morning, your life is a stewardship. Fear God. That word fear, young people, doesn't mean that you cow down and hide. It means to reverence God, to respect God. And so life is a stewardship. You and I will give an accounting someday of our lives. And that's why it's so important, adults, young people, that's why it's so important for us to be serious about while we are living to give God our best, to do our best, to live for him, to make a difference in the world. I know some of you young people involved in your schools and involved in various uh, service uh, groups of the school. You're doing things that are great things, great deeds, great works, great things to do for other people. And I applaud you and cheer you on for doing those things. And uh, I, I want to say to the rest of us here this morning, Look at your life and ask yourself. Someone asked me this past week, asked the question, said, I almost called you the other morning at 3 a.m. I said, my phone was on. You could have done that. Someone was saying, I feel like I've wasted it all. I feel like I've wasted life. I just needed to talk to somebody. I want to ask you a question this morning. Start today. Start where you are today. Seize the opportunity. Make a vow to God. Lord, I'm going to do my best to serve you and to give you my all because I know that you gave me life and you've given me life everlasting. And therefore, what I can do for you until I see you someday. And young people, let me remind all of us here this morning how many young people are dying all over the world. Age is no respecter of death. When I was growing up, it seemed like it was all old people. But now that I am one of them, it seems to me like there's more young people than old people. And so I would encourage you this morning, through these studies we've had in Solomon, live life. It's an adventure, but live it by faith. Life is a gift. Enjoy it while you can. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. Life is a school, so learn the lessons. Some of them are tough lessons, lessons we don't like, lessons we don't want to learn, but unfortunately, we're caught up in this thing called life, and we're caught up in all of the things that it throws at us. So learn the lessons, but don't let it drag you down. Pick yourself up by the bootstraps and start all over again. I'm grateful that God is a God of a second chance, aren't you? I'm grateful he's the God of a third chance. Let me tell you, we fall and fail miserably, but I'm thankful in him we have life. Life is a school. Learn your lessons. Lastly, life is a stewardship. Fear God. I want to read from Acts chapter 17, verse 24 through 28 in closing for today. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 28. Notice what Luke records in the book of Acts. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. I want to stop there for just a second. For those of you that have kept up with the news recently and to know that Notre Dame 
opened up after the fire. And uh, for the past five years, artisans from all over the world have gathered, sculptors, engineers, and that beautiful, incredible edifice where 1,500 people this weekend met, world leaders met there. Took them five years to reconstruct. It was built back uh, 800 years ago, and it took 200 years to build it back then. They reconstructed it in five years today. But let me tell you where that verse number 24 says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, notice does not dwell in temples made with hands. Let me tell you, if you have Jesus in your heart this morning, he is, your heart is the temple, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't dwell in buildings God dwells within the hearts of people who've trusted him as their Lord and Savior. Look at verse number 25. Nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and get this phrase, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Verse 27, he says, so that they should seek the Lord. Let me tell you, I mentioned last week or couple of Sundays ago, death is not an accident. Now, you may die in an accident, but death is not an accident. Death is an appointment. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. In verse number 28, for in him, in who? God. For in him, what do we do? We live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. This morning, in closing out this 10-week series, out of the book of Ecclesiastes, do you live life under the sun without God? If you do, it's going to be hopeless, meaningless, purposeless, and you're going to look at life with great monotony. Or do you conclude as Solomon did with the personal application. Life with God is an adventure. So live it by faith. Enjoy it. Seize the moment. Learn from its lessons. For your life is a stewardship from the moment you trust God until you stand in his presence someday. Would you stand as we pray together this morning? Father God, as we pause, we thank you for these 10 weeks that you have taught us about Solomon and life and all of the various situations. God, I pray that we can learn the lessons that Solomon had to learn a hard way. Thank you for this good church and your good people, these young people, how we love them. And God, we pray for them. God, bless them. Put a hedge of protection around their lives. Keep them safe and close to you. Bless their parents and grandparents as they mentor them and lead them, Father, through the time that we have with them. Thank you for this day, Holy Spirit of the living God. This is your invitation. If someone needs to come, speak to their heart to give their life to you or to join this church or to come and pray at these altars. For it's in Christ's name we pray.